Jennifer Haig is the author of the highly acclaimed novels Mrs. Kimball, Baker Towers, The Condition, Faith, and Heat and Light, and a book of short stories, News from Heaven. Her books have won the Penn Hemingway Award, the Massachusetts Book Award, and the Penn New England Award in fiction, and have been published in 18 languages. Uh, the Washington Post book world has called her a gifted chronicler of the human condition. Uh, I, couldn't read, I couldn't agree more for what it's worth. Uh, her newest novel, Mercy Street, is set in a women's clinic in Boston. In it, Haig deftly weaves characters' wildly different points of view on reproductive health. It is a timely, powerful, powerful, beautifully written book that moves the national conversation along. Please welcome Jennifer Haig. Thank you. I am so thrilled to be here at the Brattleboro Literary Festival talking about this book. It's my first time here. Um, this is a book that was very hard to write. It's the first book I've ever written that actually does come from my own personal experience. I'm a novelist, so I make everything up. And I made up a lot in this book, too. But the core of the story, where the story takes place and what it involves, is absolutely real. Um, as you heard, Mercy Street is set at a clinic in Boston. It's a clinic that does abortions. It's very much modeled on a clinic where I worked for some years as a volunteer counselor. And um, a, a lot of um, the clinic scenes in this book are drawn directly from what I observed there. I will say this, I, I never intended to write a book about an abortion clinic. I mean, it really sounds to me like a terrible idea. Um, you know, growing up where and how I did, I was very aware of what a divisive and inflammatory topic this is. I, I grew up um, in a tiny little town, socially conservative, observant Catholic family. I went to 12 years of Catholic school. I never met a person who was openly pro-choice until I went to college. So this was certainly not um, a hill I was willing to die on as a novelist. Um, I started volunteering at this clinic, not because I wanted to write about it, I didn't, but, but because I really believed in the work this clinic was doing. And it was only after having worked there for some years that it became clear to me that this is something I really do need to write about. Uh, Mercy Street opens in the winter of 2015. If you were living in New England in that winter, you remember it. And that, that snowpocalypse, that, that dreadful Boston winter, is absolutely at the center of this story. Um, this clinic, as you heard, is set in downtown Boston. The main character is a woman named Claudia Birch, who works as a counselor at this clinic. Not a volunteer like I was, but a, but a, a real, um, this is her daily. You know, every day she goes to work at this clinic, fights her way past a gauntlet of protesters just to do her job. As a volunteer, I had that experience at the clinic where I worked, and um, it seemed very natural to me that that would be the beginning of this story. So I'm going to read to you a bit from the beginning of the book, and this is Claudia, the counselor at work. And then afterward, um, we can talk a little bit more, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So this is uh, from the first chapter of Mercy Street. On a frigid Wednesday morning in mid-February, a crowd gathered in front of the clinic, their backs to Mercy Street. Claudia stood at a second floor window in the staff kitchen, counting heads. 36, she said. Seen from above, the protesters looked organized. They stood in concentric circles like the growth rings of a tree. In the center were the professionals, archdiocesan priests in slick nylon dress slacks, a few monks from the Franciscan Monastery in New Bedford, the tails of their brown robes peeking out from beneath winter coats. In the outer rings were the regular people, holding rosary beads or carrying signs. They'd come straight from church, their foreheads marked with dark soot, like gunshot victims, Claudia thought. That morning, riding the MBTA train to work, she'd seen a lot of dirty foreheads. 
In Boston, still, despite recent events, the most Catholic city in America, Ash Wednesday could not be ignored. Mary Fahey, the intake nurse, joined her at the window. For Ash Wednesday, that's not so impressive. Last year, we had twice that many. Claudia said, it must be the snow. The staff kitchen was small and cluttered, a fresh pot of coffee brewing. The television was tuned to NECN, the New England Cable Network. Winter was the top story, the snowiest in 364 years, which was roughly how long people had been complaining about the weather here. Another storm was on the way, a low pressure system forming in the Caribbean. Batten down the hatches, folks, it's another monster Norista. The weatherman, a shovel-faced man in an ill-fitting sports coat, couldn't hide his glee. Did you count those guys in back? Mary asked. A few lurkers stood at the margins, staring at cell phones like bored strangers at a bus stop. Whether they were protesters or indifferent bystanders was impossible to say. No, said Claudia, I wasn't sure about them. 36, she felt, was a sizable number. In their bulky coats, they might have been carrying anything. There were 12 staff working at the clinic, except for Luis, the security guard, all female, all unarmed. She studied the foreheads. The significance of the ritual was a little murky. The idea, apparently, was to remind the faithful of their mortality, as though anyone could possibly need that. How it all ended was a poorly kept secret. Spoilers were everywhere. 36 was a sizable number, and anyway, it only took one. A monster norista. It was that year's accepted usage, the agreed upon nomenclature. In the winter of 2015 in Boston, a storm couldn't be called severe or powerful or even wicked. By Ash Wednesday, the season had been branded. Another monster norista was on its way. Mercy Street is barely a street. It spans a single block southeast of Boston Common in a part of town once known as the Combat Zone. Long ago, this was the city's red light district, a dark congested neighborhood of taverns and massage parlors, peep shows and skin flicks, 20th century perversions that now seem quaint as corsets. Prostitutes loitered in front of Good Time Charlie's, calling out to the men in uniform, sailors on shore leave from Charlestown Navy Yard. They're all gone now, the girls, the sailors. Over the years, the neighborhood has gentrified. By all appearances, combat has ceased. After the Navy Yard closed, the dive bars were raised, the crumbling streets repaved. The porn theaters hung on a couple more years until the digital age finished them off completely. Now lonely men stay home to masturbate in front of computers, a win for technology. There's no longer any reason to leave the house. Sex left the combat zone. Then the builders came. The new erections were office towers, parking garages, commercial space for shops and restaurants, easily accessible by the Chinatown and downtown crossing T-stops. When they leased the building, the clinic's board of directors, 2,000 miles away in Chicago, had never heard of the combat zone. Completely by accident, they made a poetic choice. Hanging above the clinic's front door is a wooden sign, painted blue and lemon yellow, women's options, a name no one uses. In Boston, it is known simply as Mercy Street. Down on the sidewalk, a priest led prayers into a handheld megaphone, at double speed, like a cattle auctioneer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. <laughs> the crowd answered in a low hum, like a swarm of bees. Hey, guess what? Mary said with a certain satisfaction. They're all men. Are you sure? This was not typical. Claudia blamed Ash Wednesday, the overrepresentation of religious professionals. I could swear I saw a woman. In hats and scarves and chunky winter coats, the protesters were ageless, shapeless, sexless. A few had set down their signs to pray the rosary. A figure in a blue parka made its way along the middle ring, stopping to wipe the snow from each sign. There, Claudia pointed, that's a woman. Coincidentally, she is cleaning. Coincidentally, Mary said. The Ash Wednesday protest had been planned for weeks. Mary had heard about it in church. Her priest had made the announcement with great enthusiasm. 
On the first day of Lent, the faithful would hold a sidewalk vigil on Mercy Street. They would ask the Blessed Virgin to inspire the young women, to save the unborn babies. They would pray for wisdom, for divine forgiveness, for grace. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. The words ran together like the disclaimer after a radio commercial, a glib announcer racing through the fine print. Those fuckers, Mary said, meaning the priests. Anything to change the subject. The subject in her mind was unchangeable. The child victims, the archdiocesan cover-up, hundreds of lawsuits settled in secret. There was only one subject, and Mary Fahey would not be distracted. Her convictions were solid and unyielding. Each year on Ash Wednesday, she did patient intakes, height, weight, blood pressure, with a smudge of holy soot on her forehead. How or whether she explained this to the patients, Claudia had no idea. It was a lesson you learned over and over again doing this work. People live with contradictions. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Mary Fahey had heard these words from earliest childhood, her own name offered to the heavens in prayer. Was that weird? Claudia asked her once. I never thought about it, Mary said. The protesters were a fact of life, a daily nuisance like traffic or bad weather. Some days there was only one, an old guy in a socks cap. Claudia had given him a nickname, Puffy. He arrived each morning like a dutiful employee in a down coat the color of trash bags. In May, he would swap it for a yellow windbreaker. To Claudia, it was like the daffodils sprouting, the first rumor of spring. In the beginning, she tried talking with them. She had no experience with religious people and was surprised, actually surprised, at the way every conversation devolved into God talk. It was like arguing a point of fact with a stubborn child who parrots a single refrain, because my dad said so, to which a reasonable adult might respond, he said that? What were his exact words? Are you sure you heard him right? Or, I've never even seen your dad. Are you sure you have one? Or, who asked him? Seriously, your dad needs to mind his own. Her attempts at rational discourse went badly. On her very first day of work, a man approached her on the sidewalk, a stocky guy in dockers and a fleece jacket, the most ordinary looking person imaginable. Please, mother, he said. She can still recall his lilting voice, so gentle it seems sinister. Also, it was the first time a grown man had called her mother, which isn't something you forget. Please, mother. Our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to you. Please don't kill your baby. He'd been to Starbucks. She could smell it on his jacket. I work here, she said. The change in his demeanor was immediate, like an actor breaking character. He looked at her as though he'd stepped in shit. You are doing the devil's work, he said. Claudia said, so I've been told. <laughs> Thank you. So that's where we begin. That's the beginning of the story. Claudia arriving at work and um, passing through the gauntlet. Um, as I developed this story, I thought about what life is like for someone like Claudia who encounters this kind of resistance from strangers on a daily basis. I worked at this clinic one day a week and I can tell you it affected me. That to walk past this crowd of protesters, have people yell stuff at you, abusive, obscene things. Um, you never really get used to it. And even someone like Claudia, who's worked at this clinic for nine years every single day, is still affected by it. So when I was developing her character, I thought about, well, how, how does a person cope with this? What, what does she do to get through her life? And so I gave her a friendly weed dealer. <laughs> um, her, her friendly weed dealer is Timmy, and he's a central character in the book. Um, so after Claudia's day at work, we see her go to Timmy's apartment and re-up her supply, which is really the only way she can sleep through the night, is to smoke some weed at bedtime. Um, Timmy and Claudia have this interesting sort of relationship there. Um, in a way, he's the closest friend she has, um, even though they know virtually nothing about each other's lives. And it is at Timmy's apartment that she crosses paths with um, another one of his customers who is 
something of a loner. I realized after I'd written the first chapter of this book, I have never before written a novel that is so packed with lonely people. And that's what these characters have in common, that they're all, they're all very solitary people. Um, so this, this guy that Claudia uh, runs across at Timmy's apartment, um, his name is Anthony. He's a guy who suffered a traumatic brain injury, is not able to work. He um, whacked his head working on the big dig and had a, had a massive concussion that he's never really recovered from. And so he's also self-medicating with weed. And um, Anthony's one of these very lonely people who lives almost all of his life online. His closest friend besides his weed dealer, Timmy, is this stranger he's met on the internet who uses um, the name Excelsior 11. And this internet friend of Anthony's is also very central to the story. He is an anti-abortion activist. They meet in an anti-abortion chat room. And um, Excelsior 11, whose real name is Victor Prine, kind of functions as the antagonist to Claudia in this story. So you get these four points of view. Uh, you, you see much of the story through Claudia's eyes, but you see just as much through Timmy's and Anthony's and Victor Prine's eyes. And as you might expect, um, they have wildly different views of um, the subject in question, abortion and reproductive rights. So, so that's, in effect, that is, that is the territory of the story. I don't want to tell you too much more because I don't want to give away too much, um, but I'm very happy to answer questions about this book or any of my other books uh, about my writing process or about writing generally. Yes, back there. Can you talk about Victor a little bit? I know it's like, don't give him away, mm -hmm. but, you know, there were parts when I was reading this book with his parts were shit, but they to like set it down. Yeah. And yet you somehow made him a fully realized human like everyone else in it. And but unlike Claudia, where it sounds like from your own experience that you might have been able to draw from your yours, like how'd you get him? Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a great question. So this guy, Victor Prine, the anti-abortion activist, he is a really dark character. His reasons for opposing abortions aren't the usual ones that people always talk about. He's not religious. In fact, he is, he is a non-believer just as Claudia is a non-believer. Um, his reasons fundamentally have to do with racism. He really has no problem with women of color having abortions. It's white women having abortions that is extremely galling to him. Um, he's somebody who is obsessed with demographics. He um, is before I'd ever heard the term white replacement theory, um, I started writing this book, you know, six years ago. I'd never heard that phrase before. But that, that fear is at the center of Victor's worldview, that he, he feels that white people are becoming a minority in what he considers his country. And he feels the only way to turn this around is to get white women to have more kids. And so this is his, this is his goal in life. And he's very single-minded about it. Writing a character who harbors the beliefs Victor Prine holds was really, was really hard, was distasteful and creepy. Um, but you know what? <sighs> to me, he's, he is as human as the rest of them. And, and it's one of those lessons you learn over and over again writing fiction. Everybody is more than one thing. It's true in life and it's true in, in good literature. There are no, there are no simple villains. I mean, Victor Prine has some terrible beliefs and does some really bad things, uh, but he doesn't consider himself a villain. I think almost nobody does. You know, even people who do terrible things believe they have good reasons for doing what they're doing and thinking what they think. And Victor is no different. So when I'm writing a character like Victor, who is very far from, from me and whose worldview I have no respect for, I, I try to tell his story the way he would tell it. I try to represent him the way he would explain himself, you know, without apology, without judgment, and trust that the reader will get it, that, that you know, people's, people's words and actions really do reveal them, and they certainly do reveal Victor. But I, I try very hard not to impose my judgment on him or any of the characters. He's living his life, he believes what he believes, and the sections from his point of view articulate very clearly what he believes and why he believes it. And as you get to know him better, you come to understand that he has, you know, 
some personal experience episodes in his past that have led him to this very skewed dark worldview. Um, so I just try to tell him the way he would tell him. The other thing that made Victor a little easier for me to get is that he's from my part of the world. Um, I grew up in Appalachia, Northern Appalachia, what my father used to call pencil techie and coal mining country. And um, I, you know, I've known this guy my whole life. I mean, in my hometown in Pennsylvania, you, you know, you see him everywhere. And so I, I could place him easily in a context. He's from a world that is familiar to me and that I actually have a deep affection for, even though it's a, it's a kind of painful, complicated place. Um, I have deep affection for it. And so I, I had a context for him that I understood intimately. And that also made it possible for me to, to get him you know, in, in this kind of three-dimensional way that you have to do as a novelist, even if, even if you deplore some of what your character does, you, you still owe it to the character to, to represent them fairly. And that's what I tried to do with Victor. I think I did. Yeah. I'll keep, I have two questions for you. One is, you talked about the inspiration sort of why you wrote this. Did you know you were going to have like a Victor person? Did that kind of, did those characters come later on and did you feel like you needed a foil or, or what? Mm, yeah, great question because, you know, you sort of don't know how anything happened. After you've, after you've written a novel and it's out in the world and, you know, you're a year or two out from the actual writing of it. I don't feel like I made up any of it. I feel like it all happened. And I will tell you none of it happened. But I feel like I just wrote down what happened. So it's this weird kind of, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost like a, an organized form of mental illness that you really, you believe your own lies as a fiction writer. So, so for me to, to try and go back and reconstruct how, when I made these decisions or why I made them, it's difficult. Um, I will say that, when I started writing, I knew that the protesters were integral to the story because it is, it is such a formative experience to anybody who works there and to the patients who come to this clinic. You know, I mean, often these patients are, uh, it's the worst day of their lives in some cases, and, and they still have to fight their way past this gauntlet of angry strangers. So I knew the protesters would be, would be central. And I felt like to get them right, that you, you need a face, you need a real person you know, rather than just protesters as a, as a group of people you're writing about. Um, but, you know, as I said, when I started writing, when I started volunteering at the clinic, I had no intention of writing about it. It was just, it was the most compelling thing in my life. And it really sort of took over my life at a certain point. I, 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 I loved doing this work. I can't say I enjoyed it. That's not the right word. Um, but it was very compelling work. Because you're having these very intimate conversations with total strangers. I was a phone counselor, so I didn't even get to see the people I was talking with. Um, but they were mainly women who had called to schedule abortions. And, and their first step was to talk to a volunteer like me. I mean, I'm, I'm not a doctor or a nurse, um, but I know a lot about abortion procedures. And so my role was to explain the procedure answer any questions and, and you know, if the woman still wanted to schedule this procedure, then to get her scheduled. So you had no choice but to talk to someone like me. And um, I mean, it was, pretty, it was pretty fascinating because many of the callers, not all, but many, um, wanted to talk about their reasons for choosing abortion. I mean, there were women who, who really did not. Like they had made up their minds, they didn't need advice from a stranger, they just wanted their appointment. Um, but, but there was a subset who really did need to talk about it and process it. And I can tell you the exact moment when I knew I was going to have to write this book, there was a woman who called, and this is so vivid to me, it actually appears in the novel, um, it impressed upon me so deeply. There was a woman who called the clinic, she had a 603 area code, so New Hampshire, and um, she said, well, I don't believe in abortion, but I, I, I have to end my pregnancy because if my ex finds out I'm pregnant, he's gonna to come to my house and shoot my kids. Um, now, I have no way to fact check this. I, I don't know who she was, it was an anonymous hotline. Um, she could have been delusional, she could have been a compulsive liar. I don't think she was. I do believe that women are the best judges of what's going on in their lives and what they need to do, and um, I, I didn't question it. You know, when I began volunteering there, I thought of, I had an idea of the reasons why 
a woman would choose to have an abortion. That was one I never thought of, I will tell you. That one completely blindsided me. And I think until that moment, I didn't fully get the urgency of access to abortion. You simply cannot guess the things that are going on in strangers' lives. And it is, it is utter arrogance for any of us to think that we should decide who has access to this medical procedure, who, who really needs it, who really deserves the right to an abortion. That's not a determination a stranger should ever make. The only person who can make that determination is, is the woman who is pregnant. And so it, it hit the whole question home to me in a fairly dramatic way. And that's when I started writing this book. And part two of that was the reaction. You wrote it, it came out before Roe v. Wade was overturned. Yeah. So has the reaction been different? Has you, have you yeah. been, like what has, how was, did everybody hear that? Yeah, oh, see, I should repeat that. I, sh I should repeat that question. Um, so the book came out um, February 1st, and that was four and a half months, roughly before the Dobbs decision. Um, so, you know, when I was writing this book, the years I spent writing it, I had no idea what was going to be happening to the Supreme Court. I had no idea that we would be in the situation we're in now in terms of abortion rights. It takes so long to write a novel that to write a book this timely, you can only do it by accident. Like there is just no way I could have known five years earlier how horribly timely this book would be. Um, so, you know, I, I completely backed into that. And partly because of that, it almost as if the book was published twice. There was the initial reaction to the book in February, and it, which, which was you know, very positive, and um, I heard from lots and lots of readers. And, um, and then it did what, what books usually do. You know, for a couple of months, there's a lot of attention on it, and then it sort of subsides a bit. And with Mercy Street, it was different because there was this kind of second wave of interest in the book in June after the Dobbs decision. Suddenly, it was foremost on many people's minds, and it was, it was a story that people were really hungry to read. Um, so I, I kind of had two sets of reactions to the book. The reactions have been overwhelmingly positive, but I think that's partly because, you know, I, this book was published in COVID time, so I wasn't out on the road doing a book tour like I normally do. Uh, for my second novel, Baker Towers, I did a 40 city book tour. <laughs> I didn't do that for Mercy Street. I sat in my house and did Zoom readings. And so undoubtedly there are readers out there, readers who've you know, enjoyed my books in the past, who were not happy with this book, who have very different um, beliefs about abortion than I do. Um, but I didn't hear from them because I wasn't out interacting with the public in the way that I, I normally would do in non-COVID times. Um, so. Undoubtedly, there are people who haven't liked it, but I, they don't really have a way to reach me, so I'm, I'm not hearing from them. In the back. So I really love all of your character development, um, and it was helpful to hear about Victor if you grew up in that area. I wondered how you knew so much about the dark web and the internet. I mean, what kind of research did you do? <laughs> oh, just what you think. It's just a lot of you know, icky deep dive, staring at a screen, looking at some, you know, dark corners of the web. Um, wow, it's, it's all out there. Um, there. There is a lot of online community around abortion rights, both preserving abortion rights and dismantling abortion rights. You know, the internet is where we meet each other for, uh, for all reasons now. And, and that is certainly true when it comes to this issue. So I did a lot of skulking around online and I went into a lot of chat rooms and, you know, sometimes wanted to take a shower afterward. Like I really, I, wow, people believe some terrible things. And, and the anonymity of the internet is, is very freeing, you know? And so people post things online that they probably would never speak out loud in life. So yeah, I certainly did absorb quite a bit of that. Yes. Um, I was wondering, so you talk about how some of these stories came from your experience volunteering in a clinic, and I also do that, and thank you for your work. Mm -hmm. um, what do you feel your ethical responsibility is when sort of using other people's stories, however, you know, anonymously in this book? How, how did you come to terms with that, and how did you feel okay? Um, what, did, what process did you go through? 
Wow. Okay. That's the hardest question I had to answer for myself as a writer. And I will repeat it. It has to do with, um, what are the ethical implications of writing about people's very personal stories, even though they're fictionalized and, um, you know, it's something I really agonized over. And I wondered whether, I wondered whether I had the right to tell these stories and how, how to tell these stories in a way that was respectful to the people who were living them. I will say that there's no character in this book that is based on any person, any single person um, that I knew. There, some of them are composites. Um, many of the calls that um, Claudia answers on the hotline at work or the patients she counsels in person, um, some of those details were suggested by people I spoke to in the years I was counseling at this clinic. Um, but you know, it's not as if there's anybody who could feel exposed by this because there's simply not one of these scenarios is lifted from anyone's life. But there are certain details that, yeah, that are lifted. It, it was, you know, the, the answer I came to and, and the way I made peace with this, this ethical question about whether I can talk about this is just this realization that this is such a very, very common secret that women carry. You know, one in four American women will have an abortion at some point in her life. That means that a woman my age, I'm in my 50s, is more likely to have had an abortion than to belong to a gym. It's that common. It's that common. And yet we're in this political bind right now where a lot of people who are opposed to abortion really think that they, the kind of women they know wouldn't do that. And they don't know anyone who's had an abortion, which is completely laughable. Everyone knows someone who had an abortion. You may not know that you know, but trust me, you know someone who's had an abortion. And yet, the, the stigma attached to this is so intense in our culture that women do not feel able to speak honestly about it. And I think not understanding how common this is, how, in how many lives this issue comes up, it makes people a little facile in, about their convictions and it makes it easier to um, dismiss the needs of women who want to terminate pregnancies. If you, can, if you can other this question, if you can say, well, that, doesn't, that happens to a different kind of person, not to my wife, not to my daughter, not to my sister, not to me. If you can make it somebody else's problem, then you can make laws that are completely without compassion. And so I think there is a greater good here in making people understand not just how common this is, but some of the deeply compelling reasons women make this decision. Do you know, my ex will come to my house and shoot my kids. That's a reason I never imagined. But you know, in, in all the patients I spoke to, I heard lots and lots of very compelling reasons. Um, women really are the best judges of, of when and whether this is necessary for them. And so that, that, that was some of my thinking around that question of ethics. But it's a, it's a hard question. And, you know, I don't know that I ever really put it to bed because in a way, yes, you know, none of these are my story. But then again, I'm a fiction writer, so I'm always appropriating. That's all I do. I haven't done any of the things I've written about, not one. So, you know, it's, it's very normal to me, but because of the intimacy of this subject matter, I, I thought about it more deeply this time. Yeah. I have a question, and, and part of the reason this book moved me so much was the detail and thoroughness with which you Render different situations, mm -hmm. poverty. You know the difference between a double wide um, you know, trailer and a single. Mm -hmm. You know, and could you talk a little bit about that research? If you didn't live mm -hmm. in, how did you get it so right? Oh gosh. Well, you know, this is very much a book about class, and everything I write is very much a book about class. I, it's never intended to be so, but because of where I grew up and the way I grew up and the people I knew and the people in my family, um, it's impossible for me to look at the world without that lens of class. And so for Claudia, this counselor at this clinic, um, 
these class questions are really important and they were really formative to her in, in coming to her own um, convictions about abortion rights. Um, Claudia grew up in poverty. She grew up in a single wide trailer, not a double wide. And the, the line in the book, and I believe this firmly, I'm from Appalachia, um, you know, it, that the diff if, if you know anything at all about mobile homes, you know that the difference is profound. And so Claudia grew up in the kind of poverty that she understands why that difference is profound. She um, was raised by a single mother. Her mother dropped out of high school to give birth to her, never finished school. And um, Claudia grew up in, um, in a very full trailer. Her mother took in foster kids to make ends meet. And so this whole, this whole world of foster care is, is really central to the story as well. Naturally, that formed all Claudia's thinking about what family is, you know, what parenthood is, what life is like for children who were not necessarily planned or wanted or born into great circumstances. So for her, it was completely formative, this entire background. Um, and um, one of the very interesting features of, of working at this clinic was the way it cut across all class lines. And Claudia's a very good observer of this because she, she reads um, class signals very accurately, the way you, the um, only people who have grown up in poverty really can read them the way that Claudia does. Um, you know, this, this clinic in the book, very much like the clinic where I volunteered, um, drew women from all parts of the city. You know, women of all class backgrounds, of all cultural and racial backgrounds, of different ages, different educational levels, different socioeconomic levels. Everybody came to this clinic. And this, you know, this waiting room was kind of a fascinating place because you really would see um, you know, Harvard students sitting side by side with homeless addicts. And they were there for the same reason. Because if you are a woman, the, the physical realities of taking care of your body are the same regardless of your background. You still, you still need your birth control pills. You still need an annual exam and a pap smear. You may someday need an abortion. The needs are the same. And, you know, it's a great equalizer in a way. We are all dealing with these female bodies, this female physicality, and it can shape your life. It absolutely can shape your life. Yes. I'm curious what you see as the implications um, with like a character like Victor, where his, his beliefs, what they are, and knowing the history of America and eugenics, and that that's a very real historical belief system. Um, look how far we've come, yet we haven't. <laughs> we haven't, you know, people, it's not even that it's coming back, it's that it's still, we never fully reckoned with that. So I'm just curious, like, what do you see as the implications with where we are now and what, yeah, what? <laughs> what, what, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's maybe, maybe one or two, countries on earth that have as complicated a racial history as we do in the United States. And we are still reckoning with it. It is still determinative. Um, it, it still shapes all sorts of decisions that are made on a policy level and, and, and people's sort of private beliefs. And I think in peeling back the lid on that with Victor, it was just forcing people to look at it like this. No, this, this is with us. This is still with us. This is not a problem we solved. This wasn't a problem we dealt with. And here it still is, and this is, um, it's part of the mix. It's these, these questions around reproductive freedom, about um, women's bodily autonomy, it's all connected, yeah. How much do you outline ahead of time? How much do you know of what's gonna happen in mm. the story? Um, so I don't make outlines. I did it once, and it was a very satisfying exercise. I spent about three months making an outline. It was a great outline. <laughs> but I never wrote the book. Because once I had done all that work, I was like, well, what's the point now? I, I realized I write novels the same way I read them, is to find out what happens. And if I already know every little thing that's going to happen, I'm not interested, interested enough to spend four or five years writing the book. So I do not outline. Um, I do know the characters very well before I start writing. I know the setting really well. Setting is very important to everything I write. 
Um, I spend a lot of time writing about the story before I begin writing the story. So I write these sort of biographies of the characters. I, I write about the setting. I write a, about a lot. And most of that material will never see the light of day. It's for me so that I know what I'm talking about. As a result, when I start writing chapter one, I don't feel like I'm writing about strangers. I feel like I'm writing about people I've known for a really long time. Um, in terms of the action of the book, the things that happen, I usually know one or two events, and I sort of write toward those events. And then I just write the consequences. You know, I, I teach creative writing from time to time um, in the graduate program at BU. And um, my students love asking questions about plot. They love talking about plot. And you know, I, I don't really, I don't do plot. I don't, I don't it doesn't interest me. It, it feels like an artifice. I think of it as causality. And really, it's just you make one thing happen, and then you just write the consequences of that one thing, and then write the consequences of those consequences. And over time, you have this causal chain of events. Um, and so you know, there's no way for me to know where the chain leads until I write the events. So I, I find out what the story is in the process of writing the story. But I do know one or two things that are going to happen. I need that much anyway. And, and I know who these people are. And because I know them so well, I sort of know what they would say or do in these different circumstances. When you think of somebody you've known your whole life, like someone like my brother, we were very close growing up, I believe I could predict with remarkable accuracy what he would say or do in just about any situation. And that's how I feel about my characters by the time I start writing, because I've done a lot of thinking about where they came from and who they were as children, who they were as young people, their formative experiences, and so on. Thank you so, so much.